So tonight we're going to be talking about going over Sutta number MN 140, the exposition of the elements. So this is one of my favorite suttas for a lot of reasons. Uh, it's a story. Some suttas are not in the form of story, but this is a this is a story with things that happen. Maybe even a little humor. It's about uh, the Buddha meeting a man who is going to join the Sangha. And um, they meet halfway and he gives a Dhamma talk, um, a reasonably comprehensive Dhamma talk. Thus have I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was wandering in the Magahan country and eventually arrived at Rajagaha. There he went to the potter, uh, Bhagava, and said to him, If it is not inconvenient for you, Bhagava, I will stay one night in your workshop. It is not inconvenient for me, venerable sir, but there is a homeless one already staying there. If he agrees, then stay as you like, venerable sir. Now there was a clansman named Pukasati who had gone forth from the home life into homelessness out of faith in the Blessed One. And on that occasion, he was already staying in the potter's workshop. So Pukasati uh, was a king in a nearby kingdom uh, from Magabha, Magabha, Magadha, <clears throat> Magadha, excuse me. And he was in um, correspondence with the king of Magadha. And they, uh, the king of Magadha sent him a golden plate that had a brief description of the triple gem, that is the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, and a little bit of Dhamma written on it. And it filled him with such joy and confidence, he gave up his kingdom and went into the homelessness and went, was going on his way to join the Sangha. Uh, Pukasati, uh, this was a result of his uh, past inclination, of course. He actually was a monk under the previous Buddha. And in that existence, he uh, was one of seven monks that went to, uh, did some strong determination sitting. They went to the top of a mountain and determined not to leave there until they attained. And they said they would not leave there even to get food. Um, so the result of that is the senior monk became an arahat. Uh, the next, uh, next monk in line became an anagami. And the other five monks uh, starved to death, of uh, which Pukasati was one. Um, so, uh, so he was reborn. He went to the uh, Tutsitsa heaven <clears throat> after that, and then was reborn under uh, this Buddha. And so that is likely why he encountered such faith and joy uh, hearing the Dhamma, and uh, likely why uh, this talk went as when it went uh, with this. Now he had been practicing for a while and he uh, knew the fourth jhana quite well. Uh, he was quite attached to the fourth jhana and, but he had been practicing before this time. And so on his way, he stayed in this uh, workshop. Then the blessed one went to the venerable Pukasati and said to him, if it is not inconvenient for you, monk, I will stay one night in the workshop. The potter's workshop is large enough, friend. Let the venerable, venerable stay as long as he likes. Then the Blessed One entered the potter's workshop, prepared a spread of grass at one end, and sat down, folding his legs crosswise, setting his body erect and establishing mindfulness in front of him. Then the Blessed One spent most of the night seated in meditation, and the Venerable Pukasati also spent most of the night seated in meditation. 
Then the Blessed One thought, this clansman conducts himself in a way that inspires confidence. Suppose I were to question him. So he asked the Venerable Pukasati, Under whom have you gone forth, monk? Who is your teacher? Whose Dhamma do you profess? Friend, there is the recluse Gotama, the son of the Sakyans who went forth from a Sakyan clan. Now a good report of the Blessed Gotama has been spread to this effect. The Blessed One is accomplished, fully enlightened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime, knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened, blessed. I have gone forth under that Blessed One. That Blessed One is my teacher. I profess the Dhamma of that Blessed One. But monk, where is that Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened, now living? There is, friend, a city in the northern country named Savati. The Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened, is now living there. But monk, have you ever seen that Blessed One before? Would you recognize him if you saw him? No, friend. I have never seen that Blessed One before, nor would I recognize him if I saw him. Then the Blessed One thought, this clansman has gone forth from the home life into homelessness under me. Suppose I were to teach him the Dhamma. So the Blessed One addressed the Venerable Pukusati Puku, thus, Monk, I will teach you the Dhamma. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, friend, the Venerable Pukasati replied. The Blessed One said this. Monk, this person consists of six elements, six bases of contact, and 18 kinds of mental exploration, and he has four foundations. The tides of conceiving do not sweep over one who stands upon these foundations. And when the tides of conceiving no longer sweep over him, he is called a sage of peace. One should not neglect wisdom. One should preserve truth. One should cultivate relinquishment. One should train for peace. This is the summary of the exposition of the six elements. Monk, this person consists of six elements, so it was said. In reference to what was this said, there are the earth element, the water element, the fire element, the air element, the space element, and the consciousness element. So it was with reference to this that it was said, monk, this person consists of six elements. Monk, this person consists of six bases of contact. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said? There are the base of eye contact, the base of ear contact, the base of nose contact, the base of tongue contact, the base of body contact, and the base of mind contact. So it was reference to this that it was said. Monk, this person consists of six bases of contact. Monk, this person consists of 18 kinds of mental exploration, so it was said. And with reference to what was this said? On seeing a form with the eye, one explores a form productive of joy. One explores a form productive of grief. One explores a form productive of equanimity. On hearing a sound with the ear, one explores a sound uh, productive of joy. One explores a sound productive of grief. One explores a sound productive of equanimity. On smelling an odor with the nose, one explores an odor productive of joy. One explores an, explores an odor productive of grief. One explores an odor, odor productive of equanimity. On tasting a flavor with the tongue, one explores a taste productive of joy. One explores a taste productive of grief. One explores a taste productive of equanimity. 
on touching a tangible with the body, one explores a tangible productive of joy, a tangible productive of grief, one explores a tangible productive of equanimity. On cognizing a mind object with the mind, one explores a mind object productive of joy, one explores a mind object productive of grief, and one explores a mind object productive of equanimity. So it was with reference to this that it was said, Monk, this person consists of 18 kinds of mental exploration. Monk, this person has four foundations. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, there are the foundation of wisdom, the foundation of truth, the foundation of re relinquishment, and the foundation of peace. So it was reference to this that it was said, Monk, this person has four foundations. One should not neglect wisdom. One should preserve truth. One should cultivate with relinquishment and one should train for peace. So it was said. One thing that you may have noticed about the suttas so far is they will give clear descriptions of what uh, one who has completed the training will have their mind be like with no grief, no hate, no greed, and so on. And so they'll also have these same descriptions as forms of training. So one trains for no greed, one trains for no grief, one trains for, and so on. So from the very beginning of training, one can look at the goal and have that in mind and understand how to train. And so when we hear about states that are not, or, or results that are not comprehensible, whether it's a jhana or how, how it is to have uh, fewer fetters or so on, um, one can simply rely on what the training is and we know what to do in any given moment. So one does not know how one needs to be to be completely without greed in order to train to be without greed. We know how to train to be without greed, and we do that every day when we meditate. Simply staying with your object of meditation, you have many opportunities to train your mind to be non-reactive and to let go of the defilements. And you've been doing this all week. When a hindrance comes up, that's productive of hate, you don't like it, or you like it, maybe it's a wonderful thought to explore, or a memory, or it's a feeling that's an emergency. When you let it be there, when you don't get involved, when you decide it's okay to be there, you're training in its that it is an impersonal situation and not an emergency. When you relax right then, when you 6R, you have a mind without greed, hatred, and delusion. Right then. And you can learn how such a mind interacts with a painful feeling, with a pleasant feeling. And when you lose that killer mind, you get to watch it again. Quite straightforward. And when you think of it this way, there is no hindrance or distraction that is really a problem. As long as you can identify it, realize it can be impersonal. Let it be there and let it be okay for it to be there. There's nothing you need to do. And every time you do that, you build up the pathway of non-reactivity. You build up the pathway of not having greed, hatred, and delusion. Like that. And how, monk, does, not, does one not neglect wisdom? There are these six elements. The earth element, the water element, the fire element, 
the air element, the space element, and the consciousness element. So I'm actually going to read this section from another sutta here. Um, the suttas have uh, repeated text throughout them. So the, the same phrases and descriptions will be used for the same topics throughout the sutta. The suttas, some, and this, this helps with memorization and it helps us understand the authenticity of some suttas with how the words are used and put together. Uh, the description in this sutta of the elements is very nice, but in uh, Majjhima Nikaya 28, uh, the greater discourse on the elements, they have a longer description, which I think is even better. What monks is the earth element? The earth element may be either internal or external. What is the internal earth element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is solid, solidified, and clung to. So the earth element is perceived as extension, as hardness or softness, things that take up space, uh, that have a certain amount of resistance, uh, that is the earth element. Whatever belonging to oneself that is solid, solidified, and clung to, that is head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bone, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lungs, intestine, mesentery, contents of the stomach, feces, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is solid, solidified, and clung to. This is called the internal earth element. So learning about the earth element, there are many ways to work with these descriptions. One way is doing specific meditations directly on the earth element. So you can see they're listing uh, body parts that have uh, solidity or extension as a primary aspect of them. This is one way to work with it. Um, actually, you can learn to feel your internal organs better than you might realize. I don't recommend you do this. Um, there's no reason to. Your heart beats fine on its own. Your intestines work fine on its own. And actually, it can trigger anxiety and concern when you have all these feelings that you may not know what they are. People get in trouble when they develop their internal proprioception like that. Unless you're doing a meditation like this. Um, because the elements are talking about form. They are part of mentality, materiality, the materiality component. Um, they're talking about body when we, uh, our body, our physical body, uh, we can use them to think of it that way. When we're meditating on elements like this, we are learning to see them in an impersonal way, learning to see uh, their transitory nature, the impermanence, they come and go, the unsatisfactoriness and the not self aspect. Whatever uh, meditation we're doing on the elements, this is often the end result. And we can use them to understand our body as not self. And this is what it's talking about here. By identifying the aspects in the body that can be uh, correlated with the element, the solid and so on, one can see that these are not self. Now both the internal earth element and the external earth element are simply earth element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. 
when sees it, when one sees it as it is thus actually as as it actually is with proper wisdom one becomes disenchanted with the earth element and observes how the mind becomes dispassionate towards the earth element one can see the three characteristics in the body and mind becomes dispassionate towards it and one can develop the understanding that it is not self and to be clung to. Anything that changes is not satisfactory uh, to identify with. If something changes and you imagine it's yourself, that will lead to dissatisfaction. It is not appropriate. We all start with a lot of identification with the body and a lot of uh, discomfort can happen because of that identification. This meditation also uh, is a lot like the fallenness meditation where one identifies parts and imagines parts of those body and how they are not attractive. The end re result is the same. When there's dispassion towards it, one can let it go. When there is a composite idea of something, when you imagine my body as this whole thing, that's a concept. And that concept is easy to be, have greed or hatred or delusion about, because it's a concept and easy to identify with. When you can break this concept apart into component parts, <coughs> the thing you had attachment to disappears. With that perspective, it was never there in the first place. And your attachment was misplaced. It was never actually possible. And again, when you have attachment to something that you cannot actually find to be there, this leads to cognitive dissonance and problems. There comes a time when the water element is disturbed and the external earth element vanishes. When even this external earth element, as great it is, as it is, is seen to be impermanent, subject to destruction, disappearance, and change. What of this body, which is clung to by craving and lasts but a while? There can be no considering that as I or mine or I am internal element, mine, my body, clearly. But we look outside at the earth, of course that's not me. But that's saying that boundary is a little more arbitrary than we might think. Our separation from the environment is not, can't really find that point, can you? We're part of that and we're subject to that in the same way. The end result of Understanding uh, not self, uh, anatta, uh, realizing no I, me, or mine there is liberation and clarity and breaking through the concepts that you hold about it. And so sometimes it can be scary to start to think about body changing, elements changing. But again, those are concepts. And when you developed his passion towards that, there's no problem at all. What monk is the water element? The water element may be either internal or external. What is the internal water element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is water, watery and clung to. That is bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, spittle, snot, oil of the joints, urine, or whatever internally belongings to oneself is water, watery, and clung to. This is the internal water element. Now both the internal water element and the external water element are simply water element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. 
this I am not, this is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the water element and observes how the mind becomes dispassionate towards the water element. The water, a water element can be experienced as cohesion, what holds things together. The water element and the earth element always appear together. They're conjoined. You can observe this, uh, the water element, if you melt ice, the solid uh, becomes liquid. Uh, Solid matter becomes liquid, and liquid matter can become solid. And they, they go back and forth. Now there comes a time when the external water element is disturbed. It carries away villages, towns, cities, districts, and countries. There comes a time when the waters in the great ocean sink down 100 leagues, 200 leagues, 300 leagues, 400 leagues, 500 leagues, 600 leagues, 700 leagues. There comes a time when the waters in the great ocean stand seven palms deep, six palms deep, two palms deep, only a palm deep. There comes a time when the waters in the great ocean stand seven fathoms deep, six fathoms deep, five fathoms deep, four fathoms deep, three fathoms deep, two fathoms deep, only a fathom deep. There comes a time when the waters in the great ocean stand half a fathom deep, only waist high, only knee high, only ankle deep. There comes a time when the waters in the great ocean are not even enough to wet even the joint of a finger, when even this external water element, as great as it is, is seen to be impermanent, subject to destruction, disappearance, and change. What of this body, which is clung to by craving and lasts but a while? There can be no considering that as I, or mine, or I am. What, friends, is the fire element? The fire element may be either internal or external. What is the internal fire element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is fire, fiery, and clung to. That is, by which one is warmed, ages, and is consumed, and that by which is what is eaten, drunk, consumed, and tasted, gets completely digested, or whatever else internally belongings to oneself is fiery, fiery, and clung to. This is called the internal fire element. Now both the internal fire element and the external fire element are simply fire element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the fire element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the fire element. So the fire element is heat and cold. Two sides is the same thing. It's also involved in vitality. And it has an interesting property of uh, being making matter increase or dip, decrease. So you can think of warm sun hitting a plant, leading growth. You can think of metal heating up, expanding. You can think of decay and shrinking or cold and shrinking. You can even think of chemistry. Chemical reactions are thought of in terms of heat input and output. How much heat is required to make the change, the physical matter change happen or how much is released when the change happens. That's the fire element. Now there comes a time when the external fire element is disturbed. It burns up villages, towns, cities, 
districts and countries. It goes out due to lack of food, fuel only when it comes to green grass or to a road or to a rock or to water or to fair open space. There comes a time when they seek to make the fire even with a cock's feather or a hide pairing. When even this external fire element, as great as, as it is, is seen to be impermanent, subject to destruction, disappearance, and change, what of this body, which is clung to by craving, and lasts but a while? There can be no considering that as I or mine or I am. When we're practicing the Brahma Biharas or uh, whatever object in doing the jhanas, we can encounter the elements in another way. When we're very quiet in quiet mind, we can observe the elements arising. Uh, they, when mind is very, very quiet, the smallest of movements are the beginning of the elements forming. And this can be seen as they rise in sequence. It's a different sequence than what's in the book here. But you can uh, see them come up one by one. This is on the level of tiny formations arising, passing away. This is very, very small. And when your mind is balanced enough, you can watch the elements form, uh, build up, build up into contact, build up into craving, build up into potentially uh, action. It can be quite fascinating. But it's important that you don't look for this. If you're in quiet mind and you look really hard, trying to see the element, what does the water element look like? What could cohesion look like? Oh, that will unbalance your mind and it will cause tension and tightness and you won't actually be able to see it well, if at all. When we're developing insight, when we're experiencing insight, we need to be careful to not look too hard. When we look too hard, we introduce tension and tightness into something that's impermanent. We try. If we're really lucky, we might get a glimpse of what we're looking for, but as likely or not, our mental idea of what we're looking for will influence what we actually see. So by looking, we see, by looking with an impression and image with a lot of craving, we might affect our perception, huh? We might have a bias in what we see. So I would suggest when you look at these things, when you look, just look, see what's there. See what's there as you see it simply in front of you. Don't try to see something. These things will be obvious when your mind is balanced. Obvious when mind is, is calm. And if they're not, it's okay. Your practice works great at whatever level your mind is at. You don't need to see this or anything in particular to go with your practice. What, friends, is the water element? The water element may be internal or external. What is the internal air element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is airy, air, and clung to. That is the upgoing winds, the downgoing winds, winds in the belly, winds in the bowels, winds that course through the limbs, in breath and out breath, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is air, airy, and clung to. This is called the internal air element. Now both the internal air element and the external air element are simply air element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. 
this I am not, this is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the air element and observes that the mind becomes dispassionate towards the air element. The air element is vibration and movement. Now there comes a time when the external air element is disturbed. It sweeps away villages, towns, cities, districts, and countries. There comes a time in the last month of the hot season when they seek wind by means of a fan or bellows or even strands of straw in the dripping fringe of the thatch do not stir. When even this external air element, great as it is, is seen to be impermanent, subject to destruction, disappearance, and change, what of this body, which is clung to by craving and lasts but a while? There can be no considering that as I, or mine, or I am. What monk is the space element? The space element may be either be internal or external. What is the internal space element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is space, spatial and clung to. That is the holes of the ears, the nostrils, the door of the mouth, and that aperture whereby that is what is eaten, drunk, and consumed, and tasted gets swallowed, and where it collects, and whereby is it excreted from below, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is space, spatial, and clung to. This is called the internal space element. Now, both the internal space element and the external space element are simply space element, and that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the space element and observes the mind become dispassionate towards the space element. Then there remains only consciousness, purified and bright. What does one cognize with that consciousness? One cognizes this is pleasant. One cognizes this is painful. One cognizes this is neither pleasant nor painful. Independent on a contact to be felt as pleasant, there arises a pleasant feeling. When one feels a pleasant feeling, one understands, I feel a pleasant feeling. One understands with the cessation of that same contact to be felt as pleasant, its corresponding feeling, the pleasant feeling that arose in dependence on that contact to be felt as pleasant, ceases and subsides. Independence on a contact to be felt as painful, there arises a painful feeling. When one feels a painful feeling, one understands, I feel a painful feeling. One understands, with the cessation of that painful feeling that arose in dependence on that contact to be felt as painful, ceases and subsides. Independence on a contact to be felt is neither painful or pleasant, there arises a neither painful nor pleasant feeling. When one feels a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, one understands, I feel a neither painful nor pleasant feeling. One understands, with the cessation of that same contact, to be felt as neither painful nor pleasant, its corresponding feeling the neither painful nor pleasant feeling that arose in dependence on that contact to be felt as neither painful nor pleasant ceases and subsides. Monk, just as from the contact and friction of two fire sticks, heat is generated and fire is produced, with the separation and dysfunction of those two fire sticks, the corresponding heat ceases and subsides too independent on a contact to be felt as pleasant or to be felt as painful, to be felt as neither painful nor pleasant, there arises a neither painful nor pleasant feeling. 
one understands what the cessation of that contact to be felt as neither painful nor pleasant, its corresponding feeling ceases and subsides. Feeling is conditioned on contact. When contact ceases, feeling ceases. And then there only remains equanimity, purified and bright, malleable, wieldy, and radiant. So we've been talking about getting into the fourth jhana here. As we let go of the body, and we're left with observation and equanimity. Suppose a monk, a skillful goldsmith, or his apprentice were to prepare a furnace, heat up the crucible, take some gold with tongs, and put it onto the crucible. From time to time, he would blow on it. From time to time, he would sprinkle water over it. And from time to time, he would just look on. The gold would become refined, well refined, completely refined, faultless, rid of dross, malleable, wieldy, and radiant. So this uh, goldsmith or his apprentice, this uh, there's actually a full sutta written about this in um, I think it's in Book of Threes, uh, around 103. Um, and this is uh, about working with one's mind. So the analogy of flowing on it, um, sprinkling water on it, and looking on is talking about uh, blowing on it, we can think of as exertion, sprinkling water on it, think of as collectedness, and then looking on as equanimity. Or you can think about it as adding energy backing off, letting settle, and just observing. In all three of these uh, are important to develop the mind, to make it fully malleable, wieldy, and radiant. If you apply too much, too much exertion to your gold, to your collectedness, to your meditation object, it will burn up. Try too hard and you will, you will lose it, yeah. If you don't put enough effort in, if you lean too much into stillness, again, it will not work. It will no longer be workable and malleable. If you look on too much without adjusting, without adjusting your enlightenment factors appropriately, it won't be ready, it won't work, and it won't further develop. So that's what this is talking about here. Using three, three analogies instead of, um, of exertion, collectedness, and equanimity, or we could talk about seven enlightenment factors. Uh, same idea, observing how your mind is, observing how your collectedness is, and working with it as appropriate in that moment. When you can work with your equanimity with your meditation object that is appropriate, then it develops and becomes steady. Whatever kind of ornament he wished to make from it, whether a, a gold chain or earrings or a necklace or a golden garland, it would serve his purpose. So too monks, then there remains only equanimity, purified and bright, malleable, wieldy and radiant. He understands thus, if I were to direct this equanimity so purified and bright to the base of infinite space and to develop my mind accordingly, this equanimity of mind supported by that base, clinging to it, would remain for a very long time. If I were to direct this equanimity so purified and bright to the base of infinite consciousness and to develop my mind accordingly, then this equanimity of mind supported by that base, clinging to it, would remain for a very long time. If I were to direct this equanimity so purified and bright to the base of nothingness, and I were to develop my mind accordingly, then this equanimity of mind supported by that base, clinging to it, would remain for a very long time. If I were to direct this equanimity so purified and bright 
to the base of neither perception nor non-perception and to develop my mind accordingly, then this equanimity of mind, supported by that base, clinging to it, would remain for a very long time. So as you're learning, as your mind develops and is balanced, it can remain for a very long time. I know all of you at this point in retreat are, are sitting, uh, sitting longer than you were in the beginning. Some of you are remaining for a very long time, uh, experimenting with two hours, three hours, four hours, five hours. Mind can remain for a very long time. As you're learning when you do this, you don't do this through trying. When you sit like this, you don't do this through pain. Maybe the first time you hear of someone sitting for five hours, your mind goes, no way. No. Why would you do that? No. Because it's really fun. <laughs> because when, <laughs> when you do it, um, you, when, you, when you start sitting that long, you do that uh, from a place of balance and a place of comfort, not from a place of pain. First of all, there are two kinds of pain that occur arise in meditation, and you should understand what they are. The first is physical pain. Physical, physical pain happens because the body is being damaged. You know it's physical pain because you get up and it persists, and it doesn't go away right away. We need to not sit through physical pain. If you sit three hours, four hours, five hours through physical pain, you can hurt yourself. And we don't want to do that at all. And then there's meditation pain. Physical pain is not sure to show up, but meditation pain is sure to show up for everyone at some point in their journey. Meditation pain you can identify because when you stand up, it goes away basically immediately. You're like, what was that? Huh got me again. Meditation pain is a hindrance. Um, when it arises, it is a painful feeling and my mind may want to tighten around it. And when mind tightens around it, when you consciously or unconsciously resist, you help it uh, stick around. Now sometimes meditation pain will just come up for a while just our, our friend for a while, and we get to get to learn from it. And sometimes we accidentally clamp around meditation pain and make it an emergency. And when we clamp around it, then it sticks around longer than it has to, than it might. So we treat it like a hindrance. We let it be there. We chuckle with it, because it can be quite amusing. It can be much stronger than physical pain, huh? Yeah, quite, quite interesting. But eventually meditation pain passes. And as it passes, um, one is then really able to sit comfortably. And as you sit comfortably and you realize there's no reason to get up, it's just a hindrance, I'll let it go. I'll work with it. I'll laugh with it. And then you stay there and mind settles, you see number one on the other side of the hindrance is a calm and interesting and collected mind. And number two, as the time goes on, mind becomes more and more collected, more and more still as time goes on. And the idea of sitting long goes from something we resist. I don't want to do that to something we get curious about. What will happen next? And that's why we sit three, four, five hours, eight hours. We sit comfortably, easily, effortlessly when we're ready to. And it can be a lot of fun. And it can allow a lot of insight as mind settles down. 
He understands thus, if I were to direct this equanimity, so purified and bright, to the base of infinite space and to develop my mind accordingly, this would be conditioned. And conditioned means it ultimately subject to the three characteristics, ultimately dependently originated, and ultimately not a reliable base, ultimately a source of suffering. If I were to direct this equanimity so purified and bright to the base of infinite consciousness and to develop my mind accordingly, this would be conditioned. If I were to direct this equanimity so purified and bright to the base of nothingness and to develop my mind accordingly, this would be conditioned. If I were to direct my if I were to direct this equanimity so purified and bright to the base of neither perception nor non-perception, and to develop my mind accordingly, this would be conditioned. He does not form any condition or generate any volition tending towards either being or non-being. Since he does not form any condition or generate any volition tending towards either being or non-being, he does not cling to anything in this world. When he does not cling, he is not agitated. When he is not agitated, he personally attains Nibbana. He understands thus, birth is destroyed, the holy wife has been lived, and what had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. If he feels a pleasant feeling, he understands. It is impermanent. There is no holding to it. There is no delight in it. If he feels a painful feeling, he understands. It is impermanent. There is no holding to it. There is no, there is no delight in it. If he feels a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he understands. It is impermanent. There is no holding to it. There is no delight, into it, delight in it. If he feels a painful feeling, he feels it detached. He feels impersonally. If he feels a painful feeling, he feels it detached. He feels it neither painful nor he feels it. If he feels a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he feels it detached. When he feels a feeling terminating in the body, he understands. I feel a feeling terminating in the body. When he feels a feeling terminating with life, he understands. I feel a feeling terminating with life. When there is no lust, hatred, and delusion. Pleasant feelings are felt impersonally. They are present. Mind does not latch on to them and does not cling to them and not, does not think of them, explore them, identify with them. He understands on the dissolution of the body with the ending of life, all that is felt, not being delighted in, will become cool right here. Monk, just as an oil lamp burns in dependence on oil and a wick, and when the oil and wick are used up, if it does not get any more fuel, it is extinguished from lack of fuel. So too, when he feels a termina uh, feel terminating with the body, a feeling terminating with the body, a feeling terminating with life, he understands. I feel a, termin a, feel I feel a feeling terminating with life. He understands on the dis dissolution of the body with the ending of life. All that is felt, not being delighted in, will become cool right here. Therefore, a monk possessing this wisdom possesses the supreme foundation of wisdom. For this monk is the supreme noble wisdom, namely the knowledge of the destruction of all suffering. His deliverance, being founded upon truth, is unshakable. For that is false monk, which has a deceptive nature, and that is true, which has an undeceptive nature. Dumbana. Therefore, a monk possessing this truth possesses the supreme, supreme foundation of truth. For this monk is the supreme foundation of truth, namely Nibbana, which has an undeceptive nature. Formerly, when he was ignorant, he undertook and accepted acquisitions. Now he has abandoned them, cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, done away with them, so they no, are no longer subject to future arising. Therefore, a monk possessing this relinquishment 
possesses the supreme relinqu foundation of relinquishment. For this monk is the supreme noble relinquishment, namely the relinquishment of all acquisitions. Formerly, when he was ignorant, he experienced covetousness, desire, and lust. Now he has abandoned them, cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, done away with them so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Formerly, when he was ignorant, he experienced anger, ill will, and hate. Now he has abandoned them, cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, done away with them so they are no longer subject to future arising. Formerly, when he was ignorant, he experienced ignorance and delusion. Now he has abandoned them, cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, done away with them so they are no longer subject to future arising. Therefore, a monk possessing this peace possesses the supreme foundation of peace. For this monk is the supreme noble peace, namely the pacification of lust, hate, and delusion. So it was referenced to this that it was said, one should not neglect wisdom, one should preserve truth, one should cultivate relinquishment, and one should train for peace. The tides of conceiving do not sweep over one who stands on these foundations, when the, and when the tides of conceiving no longer sweep over him, he is called a sage of peace. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, monk, I am is a conceiving, I am this is a conceiving, I shall be is a conceiving, I, not, I shall be not, I shall not be is a conceiving, I shall be possessed of form is a conceiving, I shall be formless is a conceiving, I shall be percipient is a conceiving, I shall be non-percipient is a conceiving, I shall be neither percipient nor non-percipient is a conceiving. Conceiving is a disease, conceiving is a tumor, conceiving is a dart. By overcoming all conceivings, monk, one is called a sage at peace. And the sage at peace is not born, does not die, does not age. He is not shaken and does not yearn. For there is nothing present in him by which he might be born. Not being born, how could he age? Not aging, how could he die? Not dying, why, how could he be shaken? <clears throat> Not being shaken, why should he yearn? No craving for being. No craving for being in any of the jhanas. So it was with reference to this that it was said, <clears throat> The tides of conceiving do not sweep over one who stands upon these foundations. And when the tides of conceiving no longer sweep over him, he is called a sage of peace. Monk, bear in mind this brief exposition of the six elements. Thereupon the Venerable Pukasati sought, thought, Indeed, the teacher has come to me, the sublime one has come to me, the fully, the fully enlightened one has come to me. Then he rose from his seat, arranged his upper robe over one shoulder, and prostrating himself with his head at the blessed one's feet, he said, Venerable Sir, a transgression came over me, in that like a fool, confused and blundering, I presumed to address the Blessed One as friend. Venerable Sir, may the Blessed One forgive my transgression, seen as such for the sake of restraint in the future. Surely, monk, a transgression overcame you, in that like a fool, confused and blundering, you presumed to address me as friend. But since you see your transgression as such, and make amends in accordance with the Dhamma, we forgive you. For it is growth in the Noble One's discipline when one sees one's transgression as such, makes amends in accordance with the Dhamma, and undertake restra undertakes restraint in the future. Venerable Sir, I would receive the full admission under the Blessed One. But are your bowl and robes complete, monk? Venerable Sir, my bowl and robes are not complete. Monk, Tathaga says, do not give the full admission to anyone whose bowl and robes are not complete. Then the Venerable Pukasati, having delighted and rejoiced in the Blessed One words, rose from his seat, and after paying homage to the Blessed One, keeping him on the right, 
he departed in order to search for a ball in robes. Then while the venerable Pukasati was searching for a ball in robes, a stray cow killed him. Then a number of monks went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, they sat down at one side and told him, Venerable Sir, the clansman Pukasati, who was given brief instruction by the Blessed One, has died. What is his destination? What is his future course? Amongst the clansmen, Pukasati was wise. He practiced in accordance with the Dhamma and did not trouble me in interpretation of the Dhamma. With the destruction of the five lower fetters, the clansman Pukasati has reappeared spontaneously in the pure abodes and will attain fine and nirvana there without ever returning from that world. This is what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One words. And so it's suggested that around uh, paragraph 22, that's when Pukasati attained anagami. So this says during the talk, he attained anagami. And um, when he was killed by the cow, he was reborn there. So somewhere around the discussion of jhanas being conditioned, not intending, does not form condition or generate volition towards any being or non-being, not engaging in the better, the taint of being. Does anyone have any questions? That's a really good question. Um, the, the, that uh, the, the Buddha was disguising himself and was hiding the 32 qualities and was actually aware uh, he was coming and wanted to surprise him, I guess. And, and so he hid himself and the qualities that made himself appear as a normal monk. So surprise. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. He, yep. Uh, saw with this divine eye that he was coming and chose to chose to meet him. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. And it's all after fourth jhana too. It's it's development after that. It's really um, yeah. Well, yeah, he's saying, like, I shall be neither percipient nor non-percipient is a conceiving. And so that, yeah, so he's talking about um, taking and identifying with, uh, with your practice. So I'm going to do uh, infinite space. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it as opposed to letting it happen and seeing, seeing what unfolds uh, like that. Not, so when you, when you try to do it, that's becoming. When you try to become it, that's becoming. When you back off and relax and you, you let it happen as it is, that's letting go of becoming there and, and uh, like that. So I think, that, I think that's what he's saying there when he's talking about the I shall be as a conceiving or like that. Let's share some merit. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas and mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddhist dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.